briefly the contact. as we go beyond uh, the group U2 to U3. So we're going to spend some time today uh, developing the techniques that are needed for virtually all the lead groups. And um, they are very complicated, some of them, and U3 shows a complication. And of course, U3 would have as a subgroup R3, so uh, this um, tensor that we're going to make here, built on U3, is also um, having it, its uh, connection with just a plain old rotation, real three-dimensional transformations. But U3, by being complex, um, has considerably, <laughs> uh, shall we say, power and also difficulty. So I uh, want to be able to show uh, what the rank one and rank two uh, objects look like uh, for U3. But then the uh, thing that we'll uh, consider is uh, rank three. Uh, that is uh, a three particle, three uh, permutational uh, uh, <coughs> S3 group, and uh, its connection, uh, its intertwining connection that we've just touched on so far really uh, blossoms uh, at, at this point. So that, that's one of the more, more difficult things that we need to understand uh, for them. Now there's some applications that we can do right away. We're going to just sketch them uh, today. Uh, and there's also the connection I'm using the names or the representations that uh, came when U3 became famous by um, being uh, a breakthrough for high energy physics subnuclear physics. So we'll see a little bit of the quark theory uh, 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 when we uh, get down to that place in this uh, lecture. In any case, uh, let's go ahead here. The uh, references are growing and uh, we'll be putting uh, a couple more. I noticed uh, that some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today um, has a, f a few things that we could add uh, to the current list. So uh, let's go ahead and just get into it here. Um, this is the way I started the U2 discussion with those uh, vectors. In that case, the vector, the rank one object, was actually called a spinner. Uh, and that's a pretty standard name. Um, so we're talking about three dimensions. And um, this is the, where the quark model that was developed by a number of uh, people. George Zweig developed the three ace model. And then there was Neyman, a, uh, an Israeli a physicist who teamed up finally with Gilman, and they, they received the Nobel Prize together. And then uh, more down to earth, I would say, uh, and down to atomic physics, uh, the U3 is a really powerful way to look at all of the states that you have in the P triplet shell, the atomic P shell, carbon, nitrogen, and uh, elements right there at the very top um, have uh, their physics based on, on that. So that's what, what, what we'd like to uh, get into here. So uh, having three things, that means we're going to have three squared things uh, when we make the, the, uh, the matrix. Uh, nine components of just the fundamental representation of uh, U3. But uh, that's uh, just the beginning for us. The next step is to uh, put together uh, two tensors. So now it's three times three uh, states uh, that we'll have uh, to work with, just dealing with the very basic idea of uh, U3. And so it's a matrix that's too big to uh, put in that little space where we had easily space for a 4x4 four four when we talked about U2. Uh, we do have to uh, make some room for it. So here it is. 
and uh, it might be a good idea to put some dividing lines in there so you can see the outer product structure again and notice for example that every one of the components of the 3x3 three three, uh, fundamental representation 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3 are all multiplied by the first component 1, 1 and then by the second component 1, 2 and by the third component uh, 1, 3 at the top row and then the other rows uh, super rows you might call them uh, follow but uh, once we get this structure then uh, the thing to look at is uh, what do the uh, the uh, permutation group operators look like and of course it's trivial for the permutation that does no permutation the identity but then the bicycle uh, that uh, flips the um, the uh, little a and b indices that we're going to be putting uh, at the base of the uh, uh, designations as we did in the last lecture uh, that the particle index and then the state index is, is, a, is a whole nother story and the two of them are working against each other in the mock mock uh, principle that we uh, take advantage of for our uh, bookkeeping so anyway, th this is the matrix. It's a little bit more complicated, um, actually quite a bit more complicated than the one we had for U2. There was really only one off-diagonal component uh, in that uh, one. Here there are three diagonal uh, components, and then all the rest of them are off-diagonal. So it's just a little bit more complicated. When we did the 2-1 two, one, to 1-2, one, or the 1-2 two, to 2-1, two, that pretty much summed up the U2 uh, subgroup that uh, this U3 has and then uh, you can see that uh, a lot of real estate is taken to grow to the U3 and that uh, continues, that's the way mathematics is, it goes up at high powers. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, let's take this S2 symmetry of U3, its projection, and see what we get uh, in the terms of the representations that will be built uh, from that. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct the S2 uh, uh, projectors symmetric boxes on horizon, or horizontal and uh, the vertical place box representing an anti-symmetric uh, projector as opposed to uh, a symmetric one. Well there are fewer components of the anti-symmetric one because there's a good deal of cancellation between these two. Well, three zeros show up here where uh, there were three ones. And then uh, it's uh, here, uh, half plus a half, uh, basically you'll see uh, a number of uh, uh, halves in places uh, where there were ones before. And uh, over here you'll see a half and minus half, uh, depending on uh, what this formula gives us. But remember that one of the things you should do when you build such things is this to re remember if you're working with um, orthogonal, I should say unitary objects, you'd better find a unitary matrix, in this case an orthogonal matrix, and that means um, the projector should be Hermitian. So if you've got a minus a half here, you better have a minus a half on uh, here. If you've got a minus i over 2 here, you better have a plus i over 2 right here. We don't have any complex numbers right now here, uh, but um, that, I'm just warning you that when you're working with these things, save your time by checking uh, to make sure your projectors are, are uh, Hermitian operators. Uh, and that's uh, you know, going to be true for all the most complicated things we do if we confine ourselves to unitary. When you go to relativity, it's a different story there. Uh, um, you you, you uh, can't uh, I guarantee that. <clears throat> there it's unimodularity is the big deal. Uh, okay, so um, of course there's the unit operator, there's the, uh, the switcher that's making uh, this thing work. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to extract from the columns here linearly independent things to make a uh, D-tran matrix the matrix that diagonalizes the permutation. Uh, we only have one matrix to diagonalize and that's the transposition. Obviously when we go 
uh, for uh, uh, third rank, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. But in any case, uh, here's what happens. And you can see uh, right off the bat here that um, I pull off the one here. So that's my first symmetric state, part of the transformation that's going to uh, reduce the permutation matrix and then give us the unitary uh, representations, uh, irreducible representations that come with doing that. And so this one right here, that's our first time we see that. So I make an orthonormal combination uh, of the one half, one half, and it's just uh, once it's, uh, over the square root of two twice. And then the next one right here, clearly uh, orthogonal to the first one. So we just put it in here without uh, any uh, argument. And um, then the uh, next one that you see, the column here is this one. So we're not going to put that one in. It's already been used. Uh, here we come to the middle of the matrix. So I put that one uh, right at the first here as opposed to down the line here. That's just a, uh, um, you know, these can be all uh, permuted in order, but this is, is uh, recognizing uh, here that we're dealing with x squared, y squared, and z squared if we're talking about R3, and then this is xy, xz, and yz uh, that are being collected uh, here from these lower uh, one half. Now this is, this guy right here uh, is a new one. This one we've already uh, seen. We've already seen that one, and that one, of course, is a copy of this one. So we're kind of done. That's all the symmetric states that I'm going to get. I'm, I'm, I'm getting here one, two, three, four, five, six. So that is going to be the dimension uh, of the irreducible representation of the unitary side of this story. And that's the thing I really want to show today, is that the frequency of, that's the number of repeats, of a representation in the permutation side is going to be the dimension of the uh, matrix on the unitary side, and vice versa. So that uh, that reciprocity uh, idea is really uh, really cool. I think it's 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 really quite beautiful and very powerful. So uh, we come over here and we look at the projector for the anti-symmetric states, which I'm going to call it orange today uh, uh, for this uh, lecture. Um, this guy comes down here and makes that. This guy uh, right here. Now, uh, this next one is new, uh, and so he gets to come. And this one is uh, already been used. Uh, zero doesn't give you anything, so we're going to skip that. And then uh, finally, that's the last one. So, uh, what we're going to have here is a three by three unitary representation that is not the original fundamental quark representation. This is kind of, well, you might call it the anti-quark. And we'll talk more about that uh, uh, later on. Anyway, we've got to take this T and transform the, uh, the D-tran and transform that, transform both the S2, we have only one matrix to transform, then there are infinite number of matrices uh, that are getting transformed of that. Now we're not going to carry that all completely through, we're just going to sketch it. But this is the basic idea right here, and the reciprocity is you know, on display now. Uh, this is the simplest uh, kind of reciprocity um, that uh, um, we have where there, none of the representations of the permutational group are multidimensional. When that starts to happen, then weird things happen over there, but the reciprocity just becomes uh, a, a, a little weirder. Okay, so what we have here are six repeated uh, representation, permutation representations. And the permutation representation has just a dimension of one. Now, it, 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 one of the things I want to keep showing uh, during this is that Here's a way to calculate the dimensions that doesn't require these hook formulas, but boy are those hook formulas nice. Because you just simply put in a couple of numbers and multiply and divide uh, the, the 2 times 1 over 2 times 1, that's one dimensional. Uh, this 2 times 1, uh, one uh, that's 1. So yeah, these are this guy and this guy are all one dimensional representations of permutation. 
But uh, what dimension do they have with respect to the unitary group when you use the way we have this, uh, the permutation uh, uh, tableaus to characterize it? Well, that, as I'm going to show once again later, the formula for that uh, gives very clearly a six dimensions for the symmetric one and three dimensions uh, for the anti-symmetric one. So these are all of the uh, way the components that we would get if we applied that D-trend uh, to that great big nine-dimensional um, uh, pile of, uh, of uh, uh, D components. Okay. So this is the way you would produce a working uh, six-dimensional unitary three uh, matrix. In other words, the TD trend would be giving you numbers in there in terms of the fundamental D, the three-dimensional D. Okay, so that's quite powerful. Uh, in other words, we have now a way to probe to get into the unitary three business. The unitary two business was really remarkable in the formula for the irreducible representations of U2 or R3 is, is powerful. And that's the Schwinger um, a method that gave us that. But this is, is, this is allowing us to go into new territory. Okay? And the hook formulas are following us. So the hook formulas <laughs> are quite magical. And this, the, the trouble with something that's magical is it's hiding something. A magician always hides it, right? The sleight of hand is, is, the, is the word, right? So when you see something that's magical, and that's what I'm seeing here all these years, I still don't understand that magic completely. And that needs to be explored. That, I mean, this is the most powerful mathematical notation that physicists have. Why aren't we uh, making some more inroads into it. The only person I know that's started to do this and then just retired is Herbert Wilf at the University of Pennsylvania, but um, we're not hearing from him uh, much now. I think he's uh, uh, quite old. In what's, fact, I don't even know if he's alive. What's that last, can you spell the last name? I could. Uh, it's four letters, W-I-L-F, okay. and Herbert is, his, is, I think, his first name. Okay, so. As, as, and, and he had a really crazy way of looking at uh, young tableaus. He made, made a map, and you imagine paratroopers coming down and randomly following in the thing, and then following hook lines to get out to the border. I think it was in the World War II, and uh, that's what you did, right, when you uh, participated in the Normandy invasion. Okay, and so yeah, it's amazing how, you know, hi horrible history can be uh, come. Uh, and then it's trigger a way to look at something as beautiful as this. All right, uh, let's go on now because I really want to do the third rank uh, tensors, uh, S3 tensors of U3. And uh, that kind of uh, includes all of the tensors that were used in the Gelman, Neyman, Zweig uh, breakthrough for high energy physics. Uh, and that was in the, the 1960s. Okay, let's uh, go ahead here and remember what we're doing here. Uh, we're talking about a rank three, three particles, each with U3 state space um, at their disposal. Okay, so we're talking about a three to the third power uh, dimension here. We're talking about 27, okay? Not a big number, but uh, when you display the number on the board, <laughs> whoa, uh, it's going to take us the rest of the lecture to fill that in if we really want to do it in as much detail as we've, we've done. But I showed you uh, that with math type you can make a chart and you can use it very uh, judiciously uh, without even uh, making a computer program uh, to fill that. But what I'm seeing now is, whoa, <laughs> that's pretty big. So let's solve this thing by S3 character table so instead, Dr. the Hyman, character theory. So is this a 27 by 27 table? Pardon? Wait, oh, wait, is this a 27 by 27 table, like the dimension of this matrix if you fill the entries? Yeah, you, you see, I'm, instead of having 1, 1, 1, 2, uh, 2, 1, and 2, 2, like we did when we did U2 with S2, 
Now we've graduated to U3 with S3, what you've got is all the arrangements of the three indices 1, 2, and 3 in a rank 3 uh, tensor. So we start with 1, 1, 1, then we go to 1, 1, 2, then 1, 1, 3. Okay, now I start over with 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 3. And that's, the, you see there are dark lines there marking the uh, threefold uh, steps uh, that we we go, okay? And so we're now we're going to be looking at just the traces of this matrix. And we're only going to have to look at uh, the trace for each class of S3, and there's three classes, so really there are only two that we have to uh, uh, worry about so much. So I'm just going to work out the trace of the matrix that we would have produced if we go ahead and fill these things with ones and zeros, like we had done, okay? And this is for the AB bicycle. Well, more than that. It's the AB, yes, and it's the BC, and it's the AC. That's one class. That's the transposition class. Thank you for the question. And then there's the uh, tricycle class, right? That's the bicycle class. There's the tricycle class. There are two elements in that, but they're going to have the same character. So I have to do one transposition, one bicycle, and I've got to do one tricycle, unicycles for free. That's the dimension of this matrix, 27. Okay, so the three classes of S3 are all we need to look at, not the, uh, the elements, uh, all the elements inside them. Okay, uh, for what we're going to do here. Okay, so this is a, a character theory uh, really helping us. And here's the first one, the bicycle. The bicycle character, each one of them, there's three of them, but you only have to look at one. I'm going to look at A, B. Okay, I'm going to look at the first two indices. So all we're going to do now is count the states that look like that. J, J, K. Okay? I want the first two to be equal so that this thing gives me a 1 on the diagonal. Okay? And there you go. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 1, 3 are all responding to a B transposition okay first two a B, first two letters of the alphabet that class is all we're going to look at uh, I'm sure there's a, a two two one a two 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 and a two two three down there okay uh, but I'm only looking at a B I'm not looking at when I have the first and third the same or the second uh, uh, half the second and third the same that would be another transposition, but it would have the same trace. And here the trace is three for them, three for them, and three for this one. Okay? So that's the bicycle uh, character uh, right there. Okay? Now let's keep up with this on the other screen here so that we can make comparisons uh, when it, it is a worthwhile thing to do. Okay? So. Sorry for this interjection, but yeah. I've got a question about the. Unitary matrices. Unitary matrices. Yes. The U, the D's that I'm calling right here. Yeah, your they're defined as having unit determinant, right? No, that's the oh, special, oh, that's special unitary yes. group. Right. That, okay. Having a unit that is very so, special. <laughs> so the unitary is unitary times complex conj or Hermitian conjugate of unitary. Yes, it. That has determinant. That has to uh, add a, to multiply up to one. Yeah, so right. basically the determinant of a unitary matrix is a measure unit, of volume. Unit modulus complex yeah. number. Unimodular um, um, unitary, just a big word for SU. SU2. Or no, but SU3. like e, a unitary matrix could have dimension e to the i phi with phi some angle, right? Well, it can have components that are complex for sure. Yeah. Well, well, I'm asking about the determinant. Oh, the, the determinant. The determinant of a unitary matrix. Yeah. I think that it has um, to be a, a, unit, mo a unit norm mm -hmm. complex number. So yeah, by making it unitary, it saves you a lot of arithmetic. Because if I do a general linear in three, yeah. which this theory applies to, by the way, we don't have to have it be unitary. Mm -hmm. It's just that in quantum mechanics, it's pretty much what we're stuck with. Right? But, probability but, conservation. 
what I'm really what this question is really trying to get at is the, the next question of between the unitary and special unitary groups, mm -hmm. there is actually a subgroup structure there, which is based mm -hmm. on you know the fact that you can have cyclic subgroups. Well, you know what it really is. It's complex plane. We can ignore the overall phase. Phase of what? The the system. You know, a system with three states. Yeah. And all I'm doing is asking what this guy's doing in that business, not what it's doing in the outside world. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And in information theory, we don't get away with that anymore. we got to know that overall phase. So you, you, you're not restricting yourself to SU groups uh, when you're doing information theory. You can. The outside phase is important. Yeah, but what I'm saying yeah. about the outside phase is it may not be a continuous function. It may be a thing of transforming by I. If you transform by I, then you don't need the whole unitary group. All you need is the special unitary group that's extended mm -hmm. by a four group having to do, or a cyclic four group for powers of I. We'll have to, uh, to have discussion of that over a beer or something. Because okay. there's, a, there's a lot going on between U M yes. and G L M. Yeah. Right, but, but and ultimately we will have to. If you're going to do relativity, you got to worry about GL, yeah. right? But I, what I'm still saying is that there's a lot between SU and U. Surprisingly so. Absolutely. Yeah, there is. I, I can, I can, I guarantee you. And information guys, <laughs> that's their bugbear because they're going to have one thing over here. It's got this little U, and this is other guys are doing the whole thing together. Is supposed to have a U, right? But the, you can't ignore the phase of this guy against that guy. Oh, no, yeah. no way. Phase phase They're beating mode. that whenever you, they get near each other. Right? So I don't know. Maybe I've stumped you. <laughs> if there's well, you stumped the whole world when you if ask questions. Group, like that. If there's a group, <laughs> we don't know how to do a, that. That's a that's a super group of SU and yeah. a subgroup of U, and then what those groups are called. I know they're out there. I yeah. just, I've, I've never studied them. Before. Yeah. No, uh, they're important too. Though. There, there's no, there's more to, than meets the eye, you might say. Well, yeah. I think Thank you. you know, like you have like, like you have like symplectic, gr uh, symplectic groups. Mm -hmm. The symplectic you, is that what you're saying? Yeah, like yeah, the, the question I perfect. asked before. You can you can build up symplectic matrices from the outer U mm -hmm. U U N and S U N uh, uh, groups, and you can have those. Very often they're the subgroups. Yeah. Usually it's usually it's products of the S U N, but the symplectic group ha has its own group because it's not just S U two N. They uh, share Dinkin diagrams uh, yeah, in the Lie group. Uh, yeah. In that sense, there are some RFA, if you just talk about the generator. We'll get to some of that later. Okay, let's uh, keep going here, because uh, I would also need the tricycle character, uh, in which instead of just having two J's equal, I have all three of them equal. Okay, and there's only three places where that happens. One, one, one. 2, 2, 2, and 3, 3, 3. So the character uh, that goes with this uh, 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 tricycle uh, operation is 3. So we're essentially home, except we do need the unicycle character, right? <laughs> right? If you do nothing, what, uh, what do you get? Well, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. That's the dimension 27. Okay, that uh, is big enough to fix it so that I decided to use character theory. <laughs> right? That's a hell of a matrix. Okay. Um, all right. If, if you have to do it by hand. Okay. Now, um, the so-called frequency formula. Uh, we've talked about this before. We didn't have to use it because most of the time the representations that we played with the little three by threes, two by twos, and you could sort of uh, fake your way through. Until we got into angular momentum j equal, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30, or 100, uh, you really need uh, this, this formula, and we mentioned it, but not in, in great detail. Uh, here it is, once again, with a link to where it is in our notes, and uh, basically it's this sum. Now, it's unfortunate that uh, we all, always, through the um, ages of group theory, which is a century or more, 
and uh, into present, we use the word frequency uh, to designate the frequency of an irreducible representation appearing in this manifold. But physicists have a lot of the things that are named frequency, right? So when I went to look for where in my notes I had the frequency formula, well, all I got was all the places where I was talking about the kind of frequency of hertz, right? <laughs> so, I don't know what to call it. Repetition formula probably would be a, a good way to, to change the name, but uh, we don't have power over a centuries of uh, logistics of verbiage. So, um, we're kind of stuck with it. Anyway, to test, to test our uh, search function, uh, I would say, let's see if, just without knowing anything, we can take your search function and find that thing. I spent an hour looking for it. It works. Okay, well, let's, tr I want to see it's it work. It's sensitive This enough. would be a good test. But there's levels and layers, so yeah. you can refine it to get better. Right, but well, that's the art. I've, I've got a map so I can Right, see so it. this is a good chance to test it. Anyway, we're going to use it now, because you need to know the order of the class. Well, we're going to have a, a character table here uh, that lets us uh, uh, have that. Okay, so the S3 uh, character table showing us all the elements. Three in this class, two in this class, and we've worked out uh, the trace for this big 27 by 27 matrix that we've got uh, for the, the, this class and for this class to be uh, three and is that right? Is that nine right? I forget what we got uh, on that. Um, I think that's yeah. Is that right? Okay. Uh, let's go ahead on this thing just to make sure. Yeah. So that trace was nine. It was three times three out uh, there. And then the last one is 27. Okay. So we're going to reduce this guy. This is, uh, this is a permutation matrix. It's also a unitary matrix. that intertwine with each other. They commute with each other. Okay. So, uh, here's the frequency formula applied uh, in this way uh, to the first. Now I'm using color. Uh, we're going to col color the scalar representation of the S3 red. Uh, we used red for the A1s, and I think we used orange or something like it for the A2. So the old name for this was A1 and A2. And then E, remember that was the one that could carry a current, it's the one that could go so it's green, and um, we'll uh, go with that color uh, as well. C-type, uh, when we think of SU2 uh, stuff. So uh, here's the, the uh, frequency that we're going to expect for the scalar, and then the next one in line here is the uh, anti-symmetric representation. So each one of these uh, formulas uh, will have the same number in the order of the class, that's three for this one, two for this one, and one for uh, the identity. And so that, that will uh, always be the same. But the uh, number that's in color here, uh, that's the, um, the uh, uh, character of, uh, from this table here. Okay? So from the symmetric uh, thing, we just put a one down for the character of the irreducible. But then we always will have uh, a different number depending on what class we're looking at uh, uh, there, 9, 3, and 27, okay? So uh, we got one more to do. This one's going to give us a 10-dimensional representation. So 10 uh, of those 27 places is going to be taken up with scalar representations uh, repeating each other uh, 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 10 times. And then this one, the anti-symmetric, we didn't have this in the uh, uh, U2 analysis, but with U3, we get one. That's all we get. Okay, uh, so uh, that's 10 plus one is 11 out of 27. Uh, and and uh, this guy's got to fill the rest of it. Okay, that's all we've got is, is this guy. And there are eight of these guys. Okay. That's 16, so we got 16 plus 1 is 17 plus 10, it adds up. Okay, so this calculation, you check it uh, by making sure that you've got the entire matrix 
uh, from uh, these guys. Okay, this being a two-dimensional representation now. Okay, any questions about this? Is this uh, pretty clear? This is uh, uh, you know, a nice yeah. way yeah, to get this number and this number and this number. Uh, I got another one. Yeah. Actually, isn't S3 a subgroup really of SU3? Because if you write out the permutation matrices, they're going to have all real elements. That's the big kicker here. Is when you uh, go ahead and do this intertwining stuff where you discover that the permutation group commutes with a unitary group, yeah. right? You're taking this little bitty group, right, mm -hmm. to, to derive facts about this monster, yeah. right, the, the U3, or U4, or U5, or so on. Uh, de it depends on the rank, uh, what one of the S groups you're going to use. So it's powerful in the sense that very few numbers go to make something that really uh, would uh, normally be uh, a, you know, a much larger calculation using old-fashioned methods. But I should, of course, point out uh, that we have new-fashioned methods that use these tableaus in very powerful ways. We're, so we don't have to go through this. We can get 10, 1, and 8, as I'll show you in just a minute, by uh, kindergarten calculation. Well, have we given a representation for the S3 matrices as 3 by 3 matrices? These guys. Um, this is S3. And yeah, then those are the unitary group would have an S3 subgroup. Yes, yeah. That's okay. what I'm asking about. But we've already done that. That's what our mock mock principle is for. Mm -hmm. Right? The, the mock mock principle had our D3, yeah. right? And there was a D3 that was inside, and then there was a D3 that's outside. Yeah. And then they commuted with each other. This is a generalization of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, well, now we got U3 that. inside and a U3 outside if you want to go that route. Mm -hmm. In other words, I can make a super group out of this thing that's on the inside. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> now that's cool because that's starting to play some you know, games that information theory wants to play. That's why I say this is important for your subfield. Perhaps. Okay? All right. Now, let's look at the intertwining. I've yeah. put the thing up there already, <laughs> so beautiful. this is the big deal right here. Okay? What happens, and it's a little bit more complicated than it was uh, for the last example, because everything was one-dimensional on the permutation side, so we just worked out what the frequency of the permutation uh, came for each one of the cases. We only had symmetric and anisymmetric to work with. And that repetition became the dimension over here. Well, that's true for this one dimensional again. Okay, there's 10 of these. So this is the famous decapolate representation of U3 that gave a Nobel Prize to those people. Okay? And then the opposite of that is this thing, which is a one-dimensional thing, and it's only one-dimensional over here because it's only repeated once over here. But this one is repeated ten times, so it makes a representation that is ten by ten for U3. And it's irreducible for U3. Just as each one of these things is irreducible for S, but you can't reduce a number any further. <laughs> right? It's when you have lots of numbers that you look for a chance of reducing. This is more complicated because these representations are two by two. And there's eight of them. Okay? Eight two dimensional S3 ear reps sitting all in a nice row. Okay? So that's the situation that we've got here. It's like this Christmas carol. Ten, what is it? Ten maids dancing eight trumpets trumpeting, mm -hmm. and a partridge in the pear tree. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there's the partridge <laughs> and pear tree, right? Do so, these, uh, do these but this is, this is weird because this is a two by two matrix, okay? And what I've got over here is a little bigger than I really know if I know my U3. I know my U3 is supposed to be eight dimensional, but this has got this has got a lot more. This has got 16. This is like 16 by 16. This is a 16-dimensional thing. Except it really isn't. 
if you do that transformation, you will discover that every one of these blocks here is a unit matrix times a coefficient of the unitary d11, say, uh, there, or d12 there, or d2. The d11 is repeated twice here, the d12 is repeated twice there on the diagonal of that little 2 by 2, which is blown up. Uh, just this, 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 this corner right here is blown up. This is another attempt uh, to show what's going on inside there. So there are going to be eight independent components. That's the answer here. There's two eight-dimensional U3s all mixed up uh, to make 64 2 by 2 Ds. Now that's the way it has to be because this whole matrix has to commute with this whole matrix for each and every one of the combination of infinite number of elements for the U3 group and six elements uh, for the S3 group. So there's, there's something really quite powerful going on here. And we need to de-something, uh, de-zero this. But you see, it has to be like this in order for this two by two matrix to go in there and individually commute with all the little pieces. They all have to be unit matrices times some number. Or it's not going to commute. The symmetry S3 will not apply to the tensors that we're building here if that doesn't happen, if this doesn't happen. So this isn't trivial. This is, this is one more example of what we said when we worked with the mock mock principle. We had a a uh, representation that was made by the laboratory people and there was a representation made by the body people, right? External, internal, right? And we mostly work with the external because, uh, you know, that's where the action was. We assumed that the outside was uh, so totally smooth and there wasn't anything that was going to uh, disturb us from uh, the outside. But those two commuted with each other and you had a choice when you made the matrices for the E representation, which was two by two. You could have it splayed out like that, or you could have it grouped when the other one would get splayed out. Okay? Now, as I, as I have said, this is a better way to find the dimensions than just going ahead and filling that matrix up with ones and pulling out the projector and then calculating what these things actually look like. Uh, that's a lot of work. Uh, for this particular well, example. Well, I think you can calculate the dimensions using Mullian series, can't you? You don't need to do anything like that. This, this is the answer right here. Yeah, but you can get this, it. Th this is far quicker than any series no, no, thing. I, th I think that you can just get it quickly, get a generating function. I challenge you to have something simpler than this. Yeah, the generating function, which will tell you yeah. for n particles, all of those sequence, whatever those dimensions do it. Are. Do it. If you can beat this, I, I'll give you a hundred bucks. I'll give you a hundred bucks if you can beat that. You just get the generating function yeah. and look at the third well, coefficient. I don't have the ability to get that generating function. Oh, you don't. No. I mean, you have to evaluate it. <laughs> I, bet, I think yeah. I can get it easily. Yeah. You might be able to prove the hook length formula if you did that. And that's an unsolved problem. What's the, what is the hook length? There it is. The dimension of the unitary uh, group. Mu1, mu2, mu3. This is, works for all things. Okay? That's um. I put m on the diagonal of a tableau that represents it. And then I put m plus 1 on the above diagonal. I put m minus 1 below the diagonal. Then I put the hook lengths in that same tableau. So I get numbers like 3, 4, 5, or this one, 3, 4, 2, oh, I it, yeah. I, I, 3 times 4 times 2 divided by 3 is 8. Yeah. Can you beat that? Uh, what, I'm saying is I, <laughs> what I'm saying is I think... I don't that, think so. <laughs> I'm saying that I think yeah. I can just take the matrices, a matrix representation uh -huh. of S3, say. Okay. And then... Uh, use a Mollian equation. Okay. It produces a generating function. Okay. And then those integers... You've already lost the game though. There's two things you had to do. I only have to do one thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, some... Yeah. You, you said yeah. I lost but the game. But let's yeah. see. I say that let's I see if Mollian series sheds light 
yeah. on this powerful formula. Well, what it's going to do is put it in the context of all of these dimensional calculations, yes. because pretty much all of the dimensional calculations can be done using the mole and generating functions. In principle, the question is actual doing it. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, let's let's see it. Yeah, let's write it up. That's what we want to see. Well, you know, I would since I don't. U3 is not a, not totally interesting to me right now. I'm just working on U2. Simple simple grad is sitting there working that's on fine. U2 instead of U3. Yeah, that's fine. This works for U2 as well. Because I don't, you yeah. know, I yeah. never, I don't see myself working with quarks anytime in the near future. I'm well, how about working with P electrons? Possible. Same thing. Possible. You're made of carbon. Yeah. You're breathing nitrogen. You can't get away from those two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and also molecules made out of them. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what this stuff is all about. Yeah. And how about space curves in three dimensions? Space curves in yeah. three dimensions will also have. Will yeah. Also I mean, we can we can do what's three. called what aboutism, infinitely here. So, yeah. let's stick with the, let's stick with the, what we've got. So in any case, uh, this was really simple right here. One, one, and two on the permutation side. But here's where the big guys are. The 10 and the uh, 8 are coming uh, very quickly, you oh. see. I could just have started the class with this and not done all of that. But that stuff that we did is really important. Because aren't, aren't we just doing induced representations here? Is this three particle thing an induced representation? Well, the reciprocity theorem involves subduced against induced. Okay. So, yeah. 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 So, here's, here's what is going to happen. If I just flip two columns of the uh, transformation, the T, now this guy over here is going to turn into a unit matrix, another unit matrix, another unit matrix, another unit matrix, another unit matrix times the, the four components, D11, D12, D21, and D22 that the, symmet the symmetric group S3 has, okay, it depends on which permutation you're talking about, there's six of them, that's easily accounted for, and you can see now very clearly that this matrix right here is going to come in with this matrix as it has to, and the previous one did as well. So now you have two eight-dimensional U3 irreps to match the two that goes with the dimension in the permutation group on this side. That's cool. It doesn't happen with one, it doesn't happen with one dimensional, even if you have a lot of them, you just have ten dimensions and you're, uh, you know, that's cool by itself. This is cooler and this is what's going to happen as we go on looking at bigger and bigger groups on either side of this product that makes the intertwining um, symmetry of symmetry, I guess is a good way to describe it. Okay? Make, is it making sense? Yeah, I'm starting to wonder about four particles. Four particles with U3. Fourth ray. Yep. Fourth ray. Yep. They've actually or observed the yeah. brief five of particles with yeah. U3. Cells. Now you're in the other half of the P shell. Right? Now you've got, instead of particles, you got holes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay? <laughs> and that's cool. That's so, the unitary stuff takes care of that. Yeah. And I'll try to show that at the very or end. Or even maybe this is too liberal, but how about 100 particles with U3 symmetry? Well, let's just do 60. 60. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll be happy. A hundred? I don't know of anything yet <laughs> that's symmetric that has a hundred, but uh, this has got some symmetry that we can really uh, exploit. All right, let's keep uh, going here. We're, we're going to be able to finish a little early today, I hope. Anyway, let's go back and look at some of the charts that are used to track uh, unitary representations. And the thing you must remember uh, that's physical about all of this is that everything that we do in the unitary world 
can be done with creation and destruction operators because the real physics problem that has unitary symmetry, UN symmetry, is the symmetry of an n-dimensional isotropic harmonic quantum oscillator. So the A daggers A and all of that stuff, actually uh, when we do it in the unitary business, I don't like having knives brought to the dinner table. That's why they use chopsticks in China, isn't that right? So you're not supposed to bring weapons uh, to the dinner table, okay? I don't think you should bring them into your physics either. So uh, instead of having A dagger, I just write A because I use A dagger more than I use the destruction operator, okay? So the creation operator will just be A, and then the destruction operator will just be somebody that has a little hat over it, okay, which is easily drawn, okay? So if you're playing with a lot of A's and A daggers, I would recommend this, especially for this group theory, okay? So that's what we're doing here, is we're uh, making operators that are going to raise and lower in, in two different directions, not just in one like the uh, U1 oscillator, uh, or the, the U2 actually uh, boils down to one direction uh, for angular momentum, uh, and that's all the main concert of quantity. Here we have two dimensions of conserved things. There are two commuting quantities in uh, U3, and uh, three in U4, and so on. As you go up and up, you get more and more commuting observables uh, to work with. And actually, U3 has total particle number is the third, so you really have uh, two dimensions and then a third, or else you just use all three numbers of uh, oscillator, a uh, quanta for each one of the dimensions of uh, uh, three, and then you say a plane uh, coming out of the board right here is a plane of constant total n. So you already see the decapola hiding right there. <laughs> hiding in plain sight. But the thing I want to look at here, before I look at some of the other ones that are covered up there, uh, is just the core, the fundamental. The fundamental thing that starts, U3, is just a one quanta, one quantum, shared by three dimensions. And that's the quark model, right there. Okay? If you don't like the quark model, don't have to like it. But this is the one that we'll be using to talk about a single p electron orbital degeneracy of three. Okay? And that's the way you would display it. And you display it by the quantum numbers of dipoleness. That's uh, actually shown, I think, in um, uh, some of these. Well, I don't have it right here. But remember when we displayed the um, matrices for this thing, uh, the diagonal guy was, the first thing was the dipole moment, and the next one was quadrupole. So I have a D and a Q axis uh, here. Uh, <clears throat> now that used to be, uh, if I'm not uh, completely off the base here, certainly some direction here was called uh, strangeness and then a quasi-spin or something like that. I mean, there are funny names that the U3 people gave. Uh, for hypercharge, I think, was one, one of them. Anyway, they had to invent um, funny names for uh, their dimensions. And then when it came time to do U4 theory, they had to come up with other things like charm. And then, uh, well, we don't want to get into high energy. They just went crazy, and that's w w w where they are right now. It's pretty crazy. They have a huge machine and not all that much uh, coming out now. It's sort of the, uh, the diminishing returns that uh, happens very often to some sciences. Okay, anyway, there's the very fundamental one. And um, you can look at it in a number of different ways with diagrams like this. The next uh, one that I'd like to look at is the, uh, we already looked at this one. This is a three-dimensional representation that was an anti-symmetric second brain uh, tensor. So th if this is the quark, that's the anti-quark. But that is the p triplet that's made in an atom that has two p electrons in, uh, going uh, there. That's the thing that will go with uh, a symmetric combination of spin up and spin down in order to satisfy the Pell exclusion principle. You're talking about electrons now, so you're talking about a Fermi model, Fermi statistics, Fermi Dirac statistics is what you call it, 
when uh, the uh, total permutational symmetry has to be anti-symmetric. So those, those three are uh, in there as well. I just have them sort of outside here. It's the anti, anti, triply anti-symmetric one that shows up in the P-third, the uh, middle of the P-shell, the atoms there. Uh, we're talking about nitrogen now. Uh, that um, is uh, a very important uh, piece of physics uh, right there. But in any case, there are the two three-dimensional U3 the, uh, representations in their uh, simplest form. Now comes the six. Remember, we had a six-dimensional one to add to the three-dimensional one to make the nine states that you got with a second rank U3 tensor. So this is the diagram for that. Okay, and he's hiding underneath the decapola in this drawing right here. You see, a 1-1, one, one, then a 1-3. You'd be using lowering operators that converted a 1 to a 3, and then you do it again and you get 3 to 3, and then there's no more 1s to take, so you're, you're at the end of the road. But then you can say, uh, add a 2, and take a 3 and turn it into a 2. So you get a 2-3, and then you get 2-2 two, two down here, and then you can come back with your angular momentum uh, lowerings, or actually the quadrupole lowerings, going from 2. Uh, 2, 2, 1, 2, and finally to 1, 1. So that's the game that's played in all of the planes that make the U3 objects, which have a trigonal symmetry. They have D3 symmetry. But more importantly, they have permutational symmetry. It goes with all those little young, uh, young tableau diagrams there. Okay, so there's our 6. Okay, that's the dichork. All right. And they're the two big guys. First, the octet. What was uh, Gelman with his pro, uh, prosaic um, attempt to bring literature into physics, mostly through James Joyce, uh, three quarks for Muster Mark. Uh, he called, this is Buddhist uh, talking here, eightfold wave to refer to the uh, eight uh, dimensions of the regular representation of U3. We haven't really talked about that, but uh, this particular uh, representation is, uh, belongs to that, and it makes a hexagon of which there are six tableau states, and then the center has two of them. And that, that, that uh, he could fit the mesons and a couple of uh, really strange particles in the center, and, and he could do the same with the nucleons, uh, uh, make a diagram uh, that set him on the road to do the next one, and that's the decapola. Okay, and this is where the omega minus particle was the very peak of his uh, ten-dimensional representation. And he's the one that did that. Zweig never got to that, so I guess that's why Zweig missed the Nobel Prize on um, this particular uh, use of U3. So um, this gives you a feeling, I hope, of what we have. Now, what I need to show you is a little bit of what's coming in the future lectures, if we have the time and the uh, patience, uh, to go through and look at the P-shell. But here's the P-shell starting with the quark model. Now, here's where I have the number two axis be the quadrupole moments of each of these uh, states. And then these are the dipole uh, moments. This one is plus one, this one is zero, and this one is minus one. Uh, the quadrupoles uh, range from a degeneracy, those by the same uh, quadrupole, two, two zero moment. And then uh, this one right here is on the other side. But those would be uh, charges of the quarks. Quarks are th a third, minus a third, a minus third, and plus two thirds. So, the quark model is using exactly the same arithmetic uh, to get that. Okay. Now, all you get from that when you put an electron on it is a doublet <coughs> of angular momentum one, total angular momentum one, capital P. Okay. So that's the old spectroscopy notion uh, for just a single P electron uh, 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 outside of the uh, thing. What is that? Uh, lithium, something like that. Okay. Can't think of right now uh, which of the elements uh, is that. But then the next one in line is this guy with two uh, guys. And there's a 
a symmetric state that has six, that's five plus one orbital states. Okay, so there's a, a singlet that needs to come out of this as we reduce the symmetry from U3 uh, to what it really is, and that's O3 O3 or R3. So you see this thing popping from a, a five-dimensional orbital uh, thing uh, and a, a one-dimensional orbital thing, where this is a six-dimensional uh, called the die quark in the, in the uh, U3 model. And what's funny is they've never found a die quark. But they really haven't found the quarks either. So let's, <laughs> let's make it even, okay? <laughs> so anyway, um, and then, and then, Here's the anti-symmetric guy. It gives you the triplet for P because I can put I spin one uh, with this thing and get the Pauli principle uh, here. Here I must put a singlet with each of these. So that's what the little one indicates uh, on the standard spectroscopic notation for what we call P squared in atomic physics. Now right at the bottom is the king of them all, uh, P third power. Okay, <laughs> nitrogen. And um, we're looking here at the noctet. It consists of orbital 5 plus orbital 3, that's D plus P, and it's all ready to take a spin, uh, a one-half uh, combination. A spin has been coupled up to make one-half. That's a doublet, so you have a little 2 on top of the thing in the old spectroscopic notation uh, for the excited states. The ground state is really a happy thing. It's completely anti-symmetric in the orbit and completely symmetric in the spin. Completely symmetric in the spin, we've already seen that. Remember when we got four-dimensional representation by doing a third rank tensor for U2? We got three halves spin, right? So that's the four, what the four means here. That's what's going to go with this thing right here. So this thing is really coupled up. Anti-symmetric combination, that means these fermions don't get to get in each other's hair. It's totally anti-symmetric. Zero probability to be on top of each other. And you gain a lot of energy by not having electrostatic repulsion uh, so active. So that's, the, that's a really coupled up spin there, okay? Now you keep going, this is what makes superconductive state, right? Paired electrons, right? It's completely paired. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, and I didn't finish the shell. Okay. The next stop is P4. This is P cubed. Here's P4. So you go this way, and you go this way. And finally, just before you close the shell and get an argon uh, atom, which is totally uh, uh, a spherical and unreactive, uh, this is P5. So this, this thing right here is what I would call uh, an anti-quark, if I'm going to give names to quarks, you see. This is, this is just this thing with, this is the one box, and this is the thing with one box missing. Here's two boxes here, uh, the missing two, the two are over here. So, you know, I put these two together, I get vacuum, okay? That's one way of saying it anyway, it's kind of funny. But, Anyway, this guy right here, okay, is the conjugate of this one. If I take this box and put it in there, I would close it into uh, something that's totally uh, non-reactive. Kind of neat, huh? So it's really a powerful way to use uh, this. And this, this stuff is, um, it goes back to, um, well, a pretty long time ago. I mean, the first one we did was uh, in 73 and then uh, it was 76 before we drew this diagram, uh, Chris Patterson and I, and uh, there is, and I haven't been able to find this one, uh, uh, dig it up. Uh, number three is there as well, it's probably 77 or something like that. See if you can dig it up. I, I think I can find it in the files if I look for it, but uh, I don't have it right now. Okay, we're just about done here. I would like you to know, and this is practically for you, Lewis, is that um, there is another way that the Russians have come up with to deal with um, unitary uh, groups, 
and it's a very famous mathematician named Gelfand. These are called Gelfand patterns. They're triangular patterns. And I wanted to, you know, first in that uh, early paper, show that the young tableau have little hook lengths, half hook lengths. There's only half a hook being lengthed here. Um, but each one of them is a number in a Gelfand pattern. So you can see he's just discovering tableaus uh, a different way, a Russian way. I think I haven't, I haven't gotten into the chapter in this book. Does that have a Galfan pattern? Uh, it does, I think, but it, it rings the bell that... No, those so guys don't sound Russian. No, no, God. no. <laughs> no, he's an Indian and uh, Japanese. There's a, yeah. th and there's yet another Russian mathematician named Dinkin that has a whole other uh, thing that involves circles and double oh. lines for all the Libras. Oh, wasn't the one who invented Dinkin diagrams? And yeah. Was he a Russian? Is he Russian? His I name doesn't sound was. Russian. Yeah. The same well, sounds European, part, like I don't yeah. know. I thought it's an American. I mean, American. Russia is just this world that was sort of isolated. And they didn't have anything to do but do mathematics and physics. So they, 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 they I mean, Landau stuff is top of the, top of the world, right? Oh, Landau yeah, was a yeah, there's, so, there's so much that came uh, in Russia. Yeah. I mean, you have nothing to do but look at the snow and drink vodka, right? <laughs> well, if that's not your thing, what are you going to do, right? <laughs> You're going to make this stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's, so. it's, a, it's a game, right? <laughs> So there is kind of like uh, something related to it when you can like construct like higher rank tensors from. That's what I mean, obviously, mean. yeah. I mean, but, and you like uh, pile up their dimensions, and, and I think like I haven't gotten there, but I think that's the main idea. Like they are like I like they are like homomorphic structures from uh, irreducible representation of tensors to higher rank tensors, and then you build up the dimension of those higher rank tensors from those. Mm -hmm. uh, from those things. Well, and you that's what I'm trying to look yeah, that's what I'm trying to look are. like. How like how how you can like actually compute the dimensions of the isomorphisms on, on the uh, how the homomorphisms work so that I can like see that clearly. Right. And understand the, the dynamics better. Yeah. But yeah. I, I mean I haven't gotten to that but I'm planning I, I really want to get to that so that I can understand the lecture better. I mean it's hard to beat these these yeah. formulas. And um, uh, I think that, that what it re really is important is, in some way, maybe by uh, Brad's uh, series uh, thing, we get some insight to what's going on here. Now, this is my contribution. It's called the Jawbone Formula. Here's another for getting matrix elements of these guys. That's, we'll look at this a little bit later. This is typical use of it. Now we're talking about actual physics in U3 uh, spectra. You see, and. Uh, that, that's letting us build the tensors directly from hook lengths. The, the other problem with this idea of just doing the arithmetic is that you have to do the arithmetic over and over again every time you induce another representation. That's the real value of the Moline approach is that it automates mm -hmm. counting for all induced representations. So. You know, the counting of, of representations, of course, on the other side is going to be the dimension yeah. no, of that's the representation. What I mean. that's and that's what, I mean. what these get. Yeah, but, but you ha it, every time you do this arithmetic, you have to do it again when you go to the next induced representation. So the arithmetic is going to be different for three particles than it is for four particles, than it is for five okay. particles, than it is for six particles. This is not. What's this that? is the same for any number of particles. No, you have to get different integer values out, though, because as sure. you get more particles... I would say, to answer that, big deal. Well, I'm that? perfectly happy to stick some more numbers in here and get it in two seconds. Yeah, but if you have to do this for an infant, you know, sequentially, mm -hmm. for four particles, five particles, six particles, yeah. seven particles, of course, you don't just want the integer numbers. You also want a generating function that's going to tell you all of the integer numbers. Contain all of the mm -hmm. integer numbers in a simple, small form. Well, there's an infinite number of those, so whatever you're doing is, is going to take infinitely long. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, but that's the point of a generating function is it yeah. doesn't take infinitely long. It's concise. To go a certain set, right? The generating function is concise. It summarizes mm -hmm. all of these integers. So you don't have to calculate them. All you just calculate the generating function. And say the derivatives will tell you the integers. Ah, that's the catch, is you have to take the derivatives. Yeah, but I don't think the derivatives are that difficult. Are they this easy? Well, okay. How do you <laughs> how do you prove that this is right? Didn't were you saying earlier that you yeah, didn't have a proof for it? I don't. Okay, then in some yeah. you know, to some people it's gonna be inadmissible then. Yeah. Oh <laughs> that's physics. Yeah. Everything in physics is inadmissible okay. in court. <laughs> yeah. So that's the, the way competition it is. is rigged. Yeah. Well, nature rigged it for us. Yeah. 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 Blame it on nature. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that's the best way to explain it is we should just do an experiment and, and see if we can determine the dimensions from an experiment. We probably could somewhere. That, that, that sort of thing um, would be great if we all live for infinite well, lives. <laughs> well, in a splitting Which, experiment, yeah. we could actually determine the dimensions of these yeah. things probably. And uh, as you know from all of the cluster stuff, it took incredible experiments to be able to see that fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean that that was amazing. and getting this guy is going to be even more of a challenge. Okay, I, uh, I'm going to just go and stop right here, and and we'll uh, take up uh, some of this. We'll do a little bit more of the atomic, and we'll also be put bringing the molecules in. Um, because putting uh, spins on uh, electrons is really pretty much the same sort of algebra as putting spins on nuclei that are rotating. So oh, we get to get uh, two fish for one pole or whatever it is. I don't know my <laughs> fishing terminology. It's the right but, season. Uh, <laughs> can two birds for the price of one or something. Anyway. That, that's what's coming, is to uh, make use of some of this stuff and develop it a little further. And maybe, maybe, finally, we have an understandable proof for the um, hook formulas that I've just discovered by trial and error, really. Yeah, this should come out of, I mean, the, the Mullian sequence, the proof of it is combinatorial in nature, so it probably is possible to prove those hook like formulas that way. There are a great many uh, formulas that are like that that involve what are called sure functions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, sure functions are the generalizations of determinants, mm -hmm. where instead of just putting like a determinant does, it puts a minus sign in every odd permutation of some polynomial or monomials, yeah. right? There is a thing called the permanent, yeah. where you just replace all those minus signs with plus signs. Yeah. So those are the two extremes in the tableau business, the totally anisymmetric and the totally symmetric, right? Yeah. Well, sure functions fill up that whole region in between. And maybe we'll take a little bit of a look at that. Would you be interested in seeing yeah. some of that? Um, well, yeah, yes. but I, th I thought I had to do more with the trace than the determinant. Well, because these, the yeah. dimensions are actually traces, Yeah. right? Now, what's funny is that we can do a lot of group theory, and I would say, some people would say all of group theory, by simply knowing the traces, yeah. okay? Now, when you look at a giant yeah. matrix, yeah. the trace is the first component yeah. of the secular equation, right? Mm -hmm. All of the other components are various, um, what do you call, minor sums, mm -hmm. diagonal minor sums, right? Until finally the last one is just one, minor that's become major, the determinant, right? And the question is, how do we get away with that? How do we get away with not knowing all of those things? And the group theory says, you don't need to know all of those things. All you need is the traces. Isn't that amazing, okay? Well, there's a reason for that, which the sure functions show you very quickly. But there are other, other things that you want to know they can make use of those well, sure I mean, functions. They're not useless. The first question, though, is are those other things variants or invariants? They're all invariants. They're all invariants. Have to be. Yep. Absolutely have to be. No question about that.
yeah. the terminant is invariant, the trace invariant, everybody learns that. They don't learn that the ones in between are as well. Those are just yeah. extremes. But let's go back to this thing about the, the phase shifts, okay? Yeah. If you have u the unitary group and... Uh, say U3, or U2 even. Let's do U2, because that's yeah, what... Yeah, because everybody it's knows the most that. simple. Okay. Yeah. And <clears throat> I'm doing, in my thing, I'm doing wick rotation. So the wick rotation in this two-dimensional space, the way that I'm inducing it, just by multiplying one of the coordinate dimensions by i. The coordinate dimensions here are going to be, it's actually a phase space, so I'm using u2 in phase space. And if we're going to... Now, is this to, i like what i do? Is where I put an i on the p. Exactly, yeah. We right? can do that. But, but that actually, makes a phaser, right? Right. That's the clock. You can do that, but in in a system of canonical coordinates, Q and P have symmetry, so you can also put the I on the Q if you want. On the to. coordinate. Yeah. It, it, either way, it amounts to the same thing, because it's going to take a circular point and transform it into a hyperbolic point either mm. way that you look at it. That's the wick rotation. So the wick, but in the phase plane. You know what it sounds like. What? A wick rotation sounds like a generalization of Lorentz transformation, which goes up a hyperbola, right? Yeah. Whereas yeah. You, you, what you were saying was well, that's what I'm about to. That's what I'm about to talk about. Here, okay. Is that you know it, this Lorentz rotation is volume preserving, so it's it's basically is a symplectic transformation or a canonical transformation. It's a, a area preserving. Actually. Area. Oh, sorry. Area yeah. preserving. Yeah. Right. It, then those matrices are going to be unit determinant, that's SU2. Mm -hmm. So if we want to take the transformation theory and expand the transformation theory to include the wick rotation, then the question is how big of a group do you need? Mm -hmm. Do you need the full unitary group? And actually for the wick rotation, yeah. you don't. Well, one of the things that you're treading on mm -hmm. is the big jump from the uh, classical Lie groups, yeah. okay, the symplectic, the orthogonal, even the orthogonal, odd, the unitary, and then the exceptionals, there are only five of those, yeah. or four. How many of the exceptionals are there? <coughs> yeah, something like that, right? Something. Handful, okay? <laughs> uh, all the rest of them, infinite sequences, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of that is the great unknown for the group, most group theorists, and that is the non-compact. These are the compact yeah. semi-simple Lie yes. groups. Yes. Outside of that, a Lorentz group is outside of that. Right. It's non -compact. And your Wick group is absolutely outside of that, right? It's preserving area, but it's going to do it, right? No, I think the, I think um, uni so unitary is compact, compact, right? You bet. So the Wick, the Wick rotation... Not com is yours compact? Yeah, yes. it is compact. Yes. S-U, S-B, S-S, S-O, S-F. Well, oh no, those are compact. You know, no. just they're called compact semi-simple. I mean, okay. just write classes. out, write out the Jacobian for it. It's going to be i times one on the di diagonal and zero elsewhere. Doesn't sound compact to me. You've got exponentials in there. You're you're not the compact people. Won't touch you. No, it is. They don't like you. It is compact. <laughs> it is Out of here. <laughs> because the determinant, because the determinant is i. Well, it doesn't necessarily. Odd. So you can have determinant that you can have determinant the imaginary I, determinant area one, yeah. and they cannot no. still be compact because the representation of each of the elements of those things is not it doesn't have a top. Uh, it doesn't have mm -hmm. a closed topology, or is but not bounded you know, topologically it's gonna be, speaking. It's going to be in the paper, but what I was thinking about today and kind of sort of just discovering today is that you don't necessarily.